Um, okay, uh, can the AV switch the screen to my laptop? Okay, thank you. Uh, hi guys, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ken So. Um, I'm a Singaporean and a uh, pleasure to be here to share some of the things I've been working on. So uh, today I have 25 minutes. I'll spend a few minutes to talk about um, my open source journey, um, you know, show some of the photos uh, along the way, and I'll spend about 10 minutes to talk about the open source software that I've developed uh, that has gained considerable traction in the open source community. And then I'll spend maybe about five minutes to talk about how I use GitHub um, daily in my work and how it actually is a, it's a fundamental pillar in how I develop the software. Uh, and then maybe five minutes for Q&A. Um, you know, just you can see how important GitHub is to my work. I only have two, three <laughs> you know, labels. One is the, this uh, Octocad GitHub. One is, this is Linux, like basically the Penguin. I, I don't really like Apple, but anyway. <laughs> but there isn't a really usable Linux three years ago when I got this laptop. So I got an Apple laptop, but I still prefer the Penguin. Yeah. Then the AI Singapore, which is where I'm working now. Okay, uh, let me get this up. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, so my open source journey started in I guess 2015, uh, sometime in January, 2015, I remember. That was around when I joined DBS Technology and Ops team. Um, at the time, I was joining as a test automation guy, engineer. So I basically write um, programs that replace the manual tester job. So whenever there's releases for uh, your trading systems, your institutional trading platforms, web-based platforms, whatever platforms, Instead of having 10 laptops and 10 guys sitting there to run thousands of test cases, I basically write code such that we have 10 laptops without people manning, and they basically do the testing automatically and run thousands of test cases for different currency pairs, buy, sell, different type of combination. So I was doing that uh, at DBS. And at, that was when I first created my GitHub account. So in a sense, I'm a late boomer to open source because it, this open source thing has been around for a very, very long time. But I only started uh, uh, being aware of open source in about two, three years ago and only actively commit code and contribute maybe about one year plus ago. So uh, yeah, let me zoom in. So this is me. Uh, I was like 25 kg heavier than now. Yeah, this guy. Um, yeah, so I can talk about weight loss too, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, and, and yeah, the, the key takeaway that I got is if we are trying to lose weight, do not try to avoid the thing you are trying to lose, which is fats. Right? Because fats are essential to life, as with all other diversity, uh, diversified food in your diet. If you try to cut out fat from your diet, your body will do all it takes and all it can to not to lose fat, because it's just essential. So don't, don't try to avoid that. Yeah. Um, so in DBS, I was there for one and a half years, and I, I thought that there can be something that's more challenging than doing automation on test systems and staging systems. Because when you're a test automation engineer, you never get to touch the production system. And you, know, you never get to do programs and automation on the production environment. That, there's no way, yes, you have no access to that. So what I did was, after one and a half years, I left DBS. I uh, basically spent about a year with my wife in Eastern Europe. And basically, we just lived there. and you know, hit the visa limit, and we come back for a couple of months. Then we fly back there again. We, we, was doing, we were doing that for one year. Uh, then I came back to Singapore. So during that time, um, it was around the time where AlphaGo beat Lisedo. So I was, uh, I'm actually a Go player, it, but usually we call it Wei Qi, uh, from Chinese uh, naming. And I've been playing Go for 15 years. So my rank is around 1Q, it's close to 1 done, but it's, haven't, it's not at the black belt level yet. So I know the game enough to really appreciate um, the shock factor. Yeah, basically, every day for that week, during lunchtime, I, I was watching the telecast live. Uh, and it's very shocking to me to see how the computer actually makes moves which 
Uh, to me, it doesn't make sense because to me, you only make those moves if you want to give, you know, give chance to your opponent. It's just a, it's a disadvantageous move. But it turns out that later on, it becomes a, quite a strategic move, which as a human, we can never think it that way. It's just random rubbish kind of move. Yeah. So I was kind of shocked. So after I recovered from that shock, I uh, bought two books from Lisedo and tried to understand more. And I, I gave one of them, the book, to my friend. Um, so I started my journey in Serbia. So Nikola Tesla has actually made his name in the US, but he's a Serbian. So this is Belgrade. This is his museum. So you all know this guy. Then this is his urn. Okay, then after Belgrade, uh, we went to Novi Sad, a small little city with 300,000 people. This is a fortress there, um, you know, the beach. We, we were there during summer. Um, after Novi Sad, we went to Budapest, but the locals will call it Budapest, which is pronounced with a SH. Yeah. And I think some of you are from this uh, event. So some of it will be repeated, but today I'll focus a little bit more on how GitHub um, is actually very important in my daily workflow for uh, development. So I'll touch on that. Uh, this uh, the Buddha Pesh Impact Hub is a co-working space. I think it's on a Sunday night, at 11 plus. So basically every day, you know, I was doing development for open source code. And I started an open source company called Tableau Automation, uh, purely just to develop process automation software for the open source. And from the very first line of code that I committed is in the public repository already. So partly it's because of interest, partly it's because um, I want to improve my development skills. So I was doing that just full time. Yeah, so in the morning, I would just get up, have breakfast, and go to the co-working space and do all the development work and whatever. You know, then at night, I will head back to the apartment yeah, and Airbnb, as you would guess. Uh, this is the Hungarian food, right? They also have all this hummus stuff, a mix of cultural influences from Turkish, uh, the, the Saudi Arabia Turkish side, Middle East, and a bit of influences from Greece, uh, me cooking, yeah, like home cooked dinner. And um, some of you might have used a software called Prezi. It's for making presentation in a very interactive, uh, animated way. So their headquarters is actually in Budapest in Hungary. So I attended a talk there by H2O. Uh, you may be aware it's a company that's doing open source machine learning and uh, data analysis frameworks. So this is a Prezi HQ. And some of the other talks that I attend. Um, then we came back and we went to Chiang Mai uh, because it was too cold. You know, we came back to, to avoid the, the limit for visa, but we cannot uh, go straight back again. It's still like winter and very cold. So we went to Chiang Mai for two months before we go back to Novisa. So this is some of the photos from Chiang Mai. Very beautiful city, but uh, it's much more commercialized than when I was there as a kid 20 years ago. And every day at Chiang Mai, I'll go to this cafe on top of a tree. It's like a, a tree house, mini tree house. And then I'll just do the coding there. You know, the, your Thai tea. And now they have Thai tea in Singapore too. Um, I remember this was when I developed the version for Macintosh and I ported the code over to work for Windows. So uh, as you will see later, uh, one of the difference between this open source version of the process automation software versus commercial one is most commercial ones are developed for Windows only. Because Windows, the back end API for automation is better. Um, I try to make it more cross platform. So I develop it to work on Mac, on Windows, and Linux. This was around 4 a.m. I, I was working at some co working space that opens 24 7. Then I was really tired and I, I, I head back, it's totally dark. It's so, like, I think it's 4 a.m. And there's also time for party, this uh, music festival in Chiang Mai. Yeah, but that day I lost my wallet, so my wife uh, 
had, had a talk with me. Yeah. That's, I think that's probably the last time I went to club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it seems like you know, bad things happen when I go, go party. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a uh, time for all this. Uh, it was during Songkran when we are heading back. Um, uh, uh, Songkran started one day before we were heading back to uh, Eastern Europe. So we were so worried that on our way back to the airport, right, we'll be hijacked by people because basically when you're on their cars, it's open air. So people will just splash water at you. They don't care, you know. They will just splash water and use gun and shoot at you. So we were very worried. Yeah. So we, we try to hire a private car. There's a, there's a window that blocks and, and they cannot attack us. Yeah. But the part from where our hotel reception to the car is still like 50 meters away. So we are actually quite worried to get drenched along the way. We, we didn't, luckily. Yeah. So th this is, you know, people enjoying the water. Yeah. And then we got back to Novi Sad. Um, yeah, the same fortress. This is uh, the moon rising already and the view at night. Very beautiful place. Um, I would like to go back there again sometime later in my life. Uh, some talks about machine learning. I signed up uh, for this talk at meetup.com. I went there and attend, and then it turns out it's all in Serbian, so I, I can't understand any, anything at all, except the charts and the graphs and all the algo trees and diagrams. But uh, this guy is the, he's the lecturer at the university giving a talk on ML. Yeah, so this, this is a collage of the photos. Oh, and sometimes open source, there's this guy, when I develop a software, he just reached out to me and said, hey, well done, you did a very nice piece of work. You know, I want to treat you something. So I said, oh, uh, it's okay, I'm, I'm just doing it for a hobby, right? So he said, oh, no, no, I insist. Then it turns out it's uh, some lecturer from Taiwan, and he has, has some nice use for what I developed, and he just transferred me $10 over PayPal. And then I said, okay, I'll use this to buy two cups of coffee and do it, convert that into code for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's literally, I'm, I'm fueled by coffee because I mostly don't eat lunch, mostly don't eat breakfast. They just have coffee and maybe dinner. Yeah. So I was like, okay, literally, right, your contribution will co be converted into code in the GitHub repo. <laughs> ah, okay, so I came back uh, last year, June. We actually wanted to go to Bristol, UK, but th at the time there was a series of attacks and uh, terrorist attacks. So. Uh, we got COVID and we just basically booked a flight back and threw away our original return flight. Um, and at the time, I continued development on the process automation tool for another three months because it wasn't completed yet. So I, I, I'm not comfortable to just put it aside. So I continued development for another three months and after I feel that it's ready and I'm ready to move on back to workforce, then I started looking for a job. I was, you know, purely doing open source, you, you, you can do your hobby and passion, but it doesn't really pay in a sense. It's just contribution. So, um, so I happened to meet this uh, guy, this director at AI Singapore, and I was saying, okay, I've developed this process automation tool. Maybe you guys can use it for data acquisition. Because for current branch of ML and AI, a lot rely on data. So you can use some of the process automation um, tools to gather the data and consolidate them, do some ETL stuff and so on. So he, he said he's actually forming a team and you know, he's uh, looking for engineer. Would I like to join? So it turns out that, that breakfast uh, meetup, informal meetup is the interview. And <laughs> I immediately typed my <laughs> application and I joined AI Singapore two months later. Yeah, so that's uh, AI Singapore. Um, some of you may ask what's AI Singapore? So let me just open this. So Air Singapore is a pretty new uh, organization. It's, you can consider it a public service because it's being funded by government, uh, funded by NRF aspect, uh, particularly. So we do things like the goal is to bring the benefits of AI and machine learning to the community in Singapore. So things will be doing fundamental research and some other things will be doing grand challenges to tackle ML problems. Uh, I think that's Wilson, right? Yeah, from DBS. Yeah. So um, tackle fundamental problems such as uh, healthcare and fintech and 
Uh, there's one more, I forgot which one already. Uh, for, for me, I'm under the 100 experiments and industry innovation. So what we do is we, we try to get uh, startups and private sector companies, if they have a problem space that can be solved by machine learning, we pair them up with researchers from A-star or the universities, you know, have nine months to 80 months and get NRF to fund the research for maybe up to 250,000. And then, you know, the private company will just need to provide the manpower and we try to build an MVP in 9 to 18 months, for example. And we also pair that up with fresh grad, which um, they'll be attached to the project to build an MVP. So that's uh, AI Singapore. Um, so process automation. The current branch of process automation is... Um, okay, I, I think I'll skip this because there won't be enough time. I'll just go straight to do a, a demo. So if you type tag UI, tag as in tagging the user interface, that you can click on the first result, you go to the GitHub repo. Let me try to zoom in. Yeah, so you come to this GitHub repo. Um, this tool can be used to do process automation. And the more commonly used term now these days is RPA, Robotic Process Automation. I'll give an example. Uh, and it's pretty easy to use. You can basically just download, unzip, and run. So let's say you have downloaded. OK. Um, OK, so now let's say I want to do an uh, example of a, some processes that I want to go to Yahoo, do a search for the word GitHub. And then I want to capture a screenshot. And then I want to go to DuckDuckGo and do some other search. So if I run this, whatever you see now is actually not, um, let me close this, yeah. Okay, whatever you see now is actually not me doing the clicking and typing. It's the automation in the back end, the tool that's doing all these uh, commands, the key press and the mouse movement. In, in fact, you don't even see the mouse, but there are clicks actually on those buttons to do the next step in terms of what to type, what to click on, and for example, like this, um, all these clicks are actually automated. So in a sense, we try to, in this uh, space, we try to build software that actually mimics a human actions in the user interface front-end layer. So instead of having discrete IT systems, we try to integrate the back-end with APIs. We build integration on the front-end layer. So between application A, B, C, D, we, uh, in a non-invasive way, there's a, on top of your existing infrastructure, we can actually build automation and integration in that way. Yeah, so we do that by using your existing assets and replicating the user inter uh, interactions. Then some other um, features that I want to highlight would be um, you can automate websites, you can automate desktop applications. Um, using visual automation, you can do OCR. You can write in 20 different human languages, English, Hindi, Chinese, and so on. I think that's quite a number, some of the Eastern European languages as well. Uh, in fact, after I built the tool, I basically write an automation flow to let it build itself, the language definition. So the 20 plus language definition are actually self-generated. When I run automation, it actually go to Google Translate, and one by one, it, it try to look for a particular keyword, check what is the matching key translation word for it, and then build it. So after I type, type UI build something, right? Like 15, 20 minutes later, the 20 languages will be out. Yeah. The only two that I manually check is Chinese and English, because the rest I don't understand. So it's like, it's probably not accurate, as accurate as what Google Translate provides. Yeah. So, yeah, in a sense, this type of automation software, in, in a sense, it can be compounded. You can let it somehow build itself over time. Um, I, I want to highlight on, because now we are very much focused, the industry focused on machine learning and AI stuff. So what I did is to integrate with, with R and Python. So um, a sample automation script will be something like this. So this is in English. So I go to this website, I click this, type these things, and you know, download. So I, after integrating it with Python and R, which are the languages for AI and machine learning now, the current branch, you get things like this. 
basically you can call R code, R libraries, frameworks, or Python frameworks directly from the, this uh, automation workflow. For example, uh, let's say, okay, let's say I try to run Python code. So we can be doing something like you go to a website, you get some data, and based on the data, you pass it to your Python machine learning framework, do some classification, and return the result, and then you take some further action, for example. Um, you can also run R code. Yeah. Yeah, with a browser. Headless browser, yes. Its default is actually headless, but uh, I think sometimes we want to do it in the uh, front end. So there are various options. You can run in Chrome, Visible, Chrome headless. You can run in Phantom JS headless. You can run in Firefox Visible. So there are various uh, flavors. Yeah. Personally, I prefer to run it in Phantom JS Invisible if I can. But if it doesn't work, I'll maybe try uh, Chrome headless. Because most websites are designed to work for Chrome. It's the dominant browser now, so it's most likely guaranteed to work. Um, okay, so we have a few more minutes. What I'll do is I uh, just want to say if you want to look for this tool, you can just type tag UI and uh, just click the first result. Okay, that will be the tool, and there's also a Chrome extension where you can record the actions, and then basically after recording, you press record from your browser, you do all the actions. At the end, when you export, you get a script that can be run right away already. So there's also a Chrome extension. Um, and then if you would like to connect with me, uh, I'll be very happy to. Uh, you can go to GitHub Constellation website, uh, look, for, look for me, and you get my GitHub. Uh, link and cancel, right? And if you prefer email or LinkedIn, it's there as well. Okay. So now I want to uh, I have just uh, three minutes. I want to touch on, on how GitHub is actually uh, very important in my daily development workflow. So first thing, stars, right? How I manage the list of things I want to keep track of is actually I start them. Once I start working on a project, I start those things that I want to keep in view. So I will periodically keep looking through those lists I start as a uh, mental guide to check what's happening for those repositories. So that's very important for me. Uh, it's like bookmarking their favorite sites and so on. So that's the star feature where you can just you know go to a, a repo and star it. Um, then there's also a dashboard uh, context. I'm also a member of Google Chrome and Google Chrome Labs, Casper JS. So it helps that you can switch to see the messages and the notification for that particular. Um, organization. So that's important. Then other things will be like notifications. This is important too, because let's say you work in the open source community, there will be situations where you have to work with other open source tools, but there are situations where it, there might be bugs. So people will raise issues. So in order to be notified when there's a fix, you've got to follow the issue. You can either subscribe or you can make a comment on the issue. So whenever there's an update for the particular problem, you get an email. Or for, for me, I disable the email notification because I log in to GitHub every day. I'll see a little blue button here anyway. Right. Um, GIS, GitHub GIS, you can check out GIS for taking notes and writing short um, code, snippets of code. For example, for my, uh, when I was doing the startup, uh, open source startup, I developed the blog actually based on GitHub code. For example, if I go here, Right, what you're seeing here, this is actually a GitHub GIS. Right? And, and oh, actually, this thing, parallax thing, can work on the mobile phone too. Um, yeah, and of course, being open source, I would want to. It's not loading. Okay, yeah, so this was my website before I joined AI Singapore. I would credit uh, GitHub. Yeah, so it's built using GitHub GIS and open source tools. Um, Another thing that you, you might find helpful is there's this thing called trending repositories. So under, if you go to GitHub Explore, you can see what are the tools and repositories that's trending. For example, this week, 
the video actually release a code for image transfer. So the certain type of image you combine into a certain type of uh, image category. So this is trending right now. Um, yeah, another one that's very important to me is GitHub Desktop. So that's a desktop app which you can use that lists all the changes you make since the last commit. And it helps because if I make a small change somewhere, I can basically in right away in real time um, see the change I made. For example, I just put some rubbish here, right? Straight away, I can see eh, where's the thing? It's too many things. Okay, straight away, I can see what's the difference um, in the code I changed. So that helps for me to compare what are the changes I made before I make my commit to the main repo. Um, okay, one more thing I want to touch on is the search feature. That's the last thing, uh, running out of time. But basically, the search feature, you can use advanced search to search for Singapore developers. And when you shortlist the Singapore developers, you can further shortlist into what type of languages. So that helps if you are looking for somebody talented with some open source project to showcase, to see you know, what are the potential people that you can hire for your new group or new startup uh, group in the company. Yeah, so that would be the last thing. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, any questions? Maybe your guys can uh, check with me later. Yeah. Thank you.